Oh, hi! You caught me sorting out my comic book messes. Speaking of huge comic book messes, why don't we check out the Brazil and exclusive Mega Man comic book series? Uh, but first, I've been told I've got a quote to read. Dear Stika, can you say the Philips CDI is the number one console that uses a Motorola 68000? Sincerely, your papi, CDI Daddy. No! In 1996, a Mega Man comic book series was released exclusively in Brazil titled Novas Aventuras de Mega Man or Mega Man's New Adventures. The comic book series is officially licensed by Capcom and was a tie-in to the Ruby Spears Mega Man cartoon and ran for 16 issues ending in 1998. To me, this is fascinating. We so often hear about Sega and Tecto in Brazil, but we very rarely hear anything about Nintendo. And, well, granted, Mega Man is by Capcom, but during this period, it was still very much associated with Nintendo. This comic book series is infamous in Brazil for several reasons which we'll get into. But right off the bat, it takes a lot of plot deviations from both the Ruby Spears cartoon and the Mega Man games. Partly because the editor-in-chief Sergio Peixoto Silva and the head writer José Roberto Pereira both admitted to have never having played the games and what story they knew they got secondhand from a friend. Additionally, despite only being 16 issues long, this series would have a multitude of retcons, plot holes and continuity issues, making the story quite hard to follow. The head staff was also constantly changing artists and writers, and in fact, most artists would only last a single issue, making the entire series look pretty inconsistent. Sometimes, you'd get a pretty good rendition of Mega Man's childlike appearance accurately mimicking his Japanese counterpart, while other times they would make him look like a full adult, while other times they would just completely drop the ball, like I don't even know what they were aiming for here. Reading every issue back to back just kept giving me visual and art style whiplash. Sometimes you'd have good proportions with detailed backgrounds and dynamic fighting poses, while other times you'd have consecutive issues whose art would look amateurish at best. This happened because, in order to keep costs down, the editor-in-chief kept asking fans to send their art and if your art was good enough, you would be selected to draw a full issue and you would have a page dedicated to you, where you could promote yourself. The thing is, if you read these pages, it turns out that most of the people who drew these issues were kids who were in college or maybe even high school, so it's unclear how much they were paid for their work or if they were even paid at all. In fact, the more issues you read, the more it seems that people were sending their fan letters with their fan art attached, hoping that they would be chosen to draw the next comic and therefore break into the comic industry. And in fact, this comic book series hosted early work of some Brazilian artists who would later become successful in their comic book careers. We have, for example, Daniel Horn de Rosa, who would end up working for Marvel and DC on runs like X-Men Forever, Green Lantern Corps and Legion of Superheroes. We also have Erika Wano, who went on to become a prominent comic book artist in Brazil, with series like Holy Avenger, Alice in Wonderland and Warcraft Legends. I should also point out that José Roberto Pereira, who was the head writer during the first five issues, is a controversial figure in Brazil. He was often described as charismatic and was generally well liked by those around him. But he was also infamous for not paying artists or only partially paying them, as well as publishing foreign comics and magazines without having the rights to them. As you can imagine, he suffered through a ton of litigation up until his death in 2012, and in fact, many Brazilian comic book fans believe that he staged his own death to escape said litigation, a theory which still persists to this day as no evidence has been found of his passing. 
And in fact, the legality of this Mega Man comic is not set in stone either. Every international source I could find would list this comic series as officially licensed by Capcom. But given this man's history, that might not actually be true. Reading the editor pages, they often mention having acquired the rights to publish this series from Capcom's Brazilian distributor at the time. They specifically mention that they would have the rights to publish four issues and that depending on their commercial success, the contract could be extended to launch more stories. Because of this, we can actually split the Mega Man comic series in three phases. The original run consisting of issues 1 through 4, the first contract renewal, which gave them the right to publish issues 5 through 10, and the final run consisting of issues 11 through 16, before being cancelled. Now here's the thing, I have a theory. Every issue in this series would come with a set of posters for free. And for the initial four issues, every poster would use official Capcom art from the video games or the Ruby Spears cartoon. But starting with issue 5, every subsequent poster would use art from Sergio Peixoto's pool of artists for this comic, meaning that the art quality dropped considerably. Now, I can't say this with complete certainty. But given what I've been told by Brazilian comic book fans, I believe that this series was official during its first 4 issue run, and that from there on, they just kept publishing the series without Capcom's consent. This is actually even more compounded when you learn the story behind a new original character simply known as the Princess. This was said to be a major series villain and the Hedge Rider had planned for her to kill off Mega Man and all of the Mega Man crew, so that they could in turn make the entire comic about her. She was introduced in a fourth wall breaking after story interview, and her arrival kept being teased as a major plot event in every subsequent issue. And the only reason why they didn't follow this through was because the editor in chief fired the head writer before he could get this far. <laughs> I mean, it kind of defeats the point of having a Mega Man comic if you're going to kill Mega Man and all his friends by issue 5. Honestly, the story around this comic is fascinating, more so than the comic itself if you ask me. Another funny thing is that the editor-in-chief and head writer used to be friends, but eventually had a falling out and became bitter enemies, publishing competing anime magazines which I'm told both were of dubious quality. Now, whether or not this falling out began due to or resulted in the Mega Man comic book firing is anyone's guess. Anyway, the first issue also opens up with a word from the head writer before he was fired. And reading this is giving me some serious Fonzie and Peprium flashbacks. Because it honestly needs to be read to be believed. It opens up chastising Brazilian publishers for not investing enough in Brazilian artists or writers choosing instead to giving money to gringos by publishing American comics and boasts how this is a Brazilian comic and that you should buy it because you are Brazilian. Now, growing up in Portugal, I actually read a lot of Disney's José Carioca comics, which were written and illustrated by Brazilian artists, as well as the Monica series. So, while I'm no expert, I don't think that the Brazilian comic book industry was doing that poorly in the 90s, but if I'm wrong, do you let me know in the comments. But then, he also chastises those same Brazilian artists and writers for choosing to work where the money is, and states how he does not write comics for his buddies, nor does he plagiarize Common Rider, which is a step at yet another Brazilian comic named Blue Fighter. Call me crazy, but for a supposed dead industry as he puts it, there sure seem to be a lot of Brazilian comics during this time. The page also states how the comic was made as a tie-in to the Ruby Spears cartoon, but then it also states that the cartoon's plot was terrible, so they ignored it. And that video games have no stories and only exist to cause tendonitis. Okay, I'm gonna need some Brazilian Guarana for this one and then request that you, the reader, send them your plot suggestions, so long as you don't ask them to make this series more like the cartoon or video games. Yeah, because who would want that, right? 
Finally, it is telling you the reader that you should do your part and buy the comic and tell all your friends to buy it as well. Who hurt you? Now, as I said before, by issue 5 the head writer was fired. So from that point on, these pages were written by the editor-in-chief, but I assure you, they did not get any better. The attacks on foreign and even Brazilian comics continued, and kept spreading woe over the fact that so many American and Japanese characters are taking over the minds of the Brazilian youth and that there are no national heroes they can look up to. Look, I understand the need for local heroes, but... You are literally doing a Mega Man comic, and Mega Man is a Japanese character. The pages also take the occasional stab at fans, who kept asking to make the stories more like the games, and dares them to create something better than this comic. It also attacks the American, Japanese and South American comic book industries, as well as the anime industry. On one issue it even boasts how Capcom of America is interested in publishing the comics in the US, a claim which I find it really hard to believe. On issue 7, Sergio Peixoto Silva even goes so far as to dub himself the Nationalist Editor-in-Chief. And... if I'm being honest, at times these pages seem to veer pretty heavily into xenophobia, especially against the Japanese. Honestly, these pages, as well as the fan mail, make for a fascinating read. Though not always for the best of reasons. And for better or worse, none of them have been translated into English. I will say that much like the story around the comic itself, I found these pages more interesting than the actual plot of the books. But now, I think we can finally look at the actual comics and their story. We open with a cover featuring Mega Man and Roll, and right off the bat we run into a problem, and that is the nudity. For some reason, this series loved to have Roll naked any chance it could get, sometimes fetishistically so, likely as a strategy to sell more comics. Don't come! The issue is that Roll is supposed to be Mega Man's younger sister, and she's supposed to have the body and mind of a child, so they aged her up to avoid any controversy. Don't come! Even in the issues where Mega Man is drawn in his child form, Roll still maintains her more mature design. Look, Brazil, I love you, but... It's kinda weird, Brazil. That's kinda weird. The story opens up with Roll in the desert looking for Mega Man while being chased by sand troopers, whose designs look suspiciously similar to Pharaoh Man from the games. As she tries to escape, she falls through a sinkhole and finds Mega Man, who's been in suspended hibernation for 30 years. You might notice that Roll is cussing in these comics, something which this series will have quite a lot of. The sand troopers attack Roll, but she's saved by Mega Man at the last minute. Roll then fills in Mega Man and the reader that after Dr. Wily was captured, all robots were outlawed, so Dr. Light hid Mega Man and Roll for 30 years and upgraded their hardware. Meanwhile, a Japanese company developed a new line of androids named Neo Mavericks, though the comic never makes it clear how the Neo Mavericks are different from the previously outlawed models. Anyway, turns out the Mavericks were in league with Dr. Wily and they took over the world in a murderous fashion. We also learn Dr. Light is dead and that both Roll and Mega Man share a hatred for humanity due to outlawing robots 30 years prior. A plot point that the comic quickly drops when the writers change hands. Still, out of all the comic book inconsistencies, there is at least one bit that I liked. Apparently, Mega Man and Roll collect their power from defeating enemies and taking their parts, which actually does seem like one of the few good nods to the games. Though sadly, this too would be quickly forgotten in subsequent issues. Rock and Roll then take an airship and set off to look for the human resistance. On the next issue, their ship is shot down by Mega Man X's automated defense systems. Once X learns who they are, he joins them, telling them that X is in fact the original prototype created by Dr. Light, and that Mega Man and Roll were next generation models, a plot point which the series keeps retconning over and over, as sometimes it tells us that Roll was the first, but then it also implies that Proto Man was actually the first one. 
all while ignoring that in the games, X was actually Mega Man's successor, not the other way around. This comic also makes it clear that both Mega Man and X went to sleep with Roll. Don't come! And that Roll is actually not against the idea either. Don't come! Which, um, let me just remind you they're all brothers. They also seemingly forget about the whole looking for the resistance thing, and instead just travel to random locations without a motive, something which even the writers admit. The comic also teases about a new character called the Princess, who as I mentioned before, was introduced in a non-canonical fourth wall breaking interview. She briefly describes how she's evil and wants to kill our heroes, but mostly focuses on how she's getting revenge on all the foreign publications and media responsible for, in her own words, spaying the Brazilian comic book industry. She is, however, officially introduced into the story in Patagonia, where a pair of communists summon her from a different dimension to spread the word of communism. Kind of odd considering the past issues imply that most humans were either dead or enslaved by Dr. Wily. But then again, the communist angle is dropped almost immediately too. The story also takes a small detour and describes how Roll used to be human once, but was kidnapped into what is implied to be sexual slavery. Apparently, Dr. Wily had an organization where they would kidnap young girls and turn them into robots for this purpose, and that Dr. Light was his assistant who opposed the idea and saved her. And although she was saved, Roll is shown to have developed PTSD due to her experiences. And while I'll admit that this is an interesting take for the character, I can't help but feel that all the cussing, sexual content, incest, mature themes and at times gore is incredibly tone deaf considering that Mega Man is a children's franchise. I mean, sure, most of its fanbase now is in its 20s, 30s and even 40s, but this was not the case in 1996. Anyway, after taking a small detour to go to the races, our heroes believe that base, called Slasher in the Brazilian original for whatever reason, is in the Patagonia base with the communists who are still trying to get the princess on their side. The communists eventually lose all patience with the princess and attack her, only to be promptly defeated, but our heroes arrive in the nick of time. They then dispatch the princess in a comedic fashion and she's unceremoniously removed from the story altogether. As I mentioned before, the previous head writer wanted to make the princess kill all Mega Man characters and make the story about her, but because he was fired before he could achieve this, her plot arc became ultimately pointless. We also learn that one of the communists is in fact Kalinka Kosek, Dr. Kosek's daughter from Mega Man 4, and it's implied that she may or may not be a Reploid herself, but this never goes anywhere. Anyway, it turns out Dr. Wily has been spying on our heroes all this time, along with a group of hooded robot masters. I find it interesting that they address Dr. Wily as if they were the ones in control, as we do see Dr. Wily often having to justify his actions to what I assume are his creations. Additionally, it turns out Dr. Wily has been manipulating our heroes all along, feeding them information on where base might be but in reality leading them towards anyone who Dr. Wily would view as a threat, like the princess and rogue robot masters. Basically, our heroes are looking for base for unexplained reasons, and they were led to believe that he's with a mega corporation not under Wily's rule. So I guess not all humans were enslaved after all. I don't know, the comic isn't clear on that. Anyway, they find base, defeat the mega corporation, though the leaders are able to escape, and it's revealed that they were responsible for kidnapping young girls 30 years ago, of which Roll was a victim. Base seems to be an ally here, but it's clear that he's hiding something, and that he is working with Proto Man and Zero, who are also spying on our heroes for unclear purposes. Eventually, Roll is examining Base, and she becomes suspicious that he's hiding something. Proto Man, seeing that she's getting too close to the truth, whatever the truth might be, pushes a button that deactivates her. Roll, Mega Man, Kalinka, and the other communists are captured, as Base and X prove to be traitors, while Zero and Proto Man reveal themselves. They claim that this was a necessary move, but before they can explain, Mega Man breaks free and the two groups start fighting. 
finally, Dr. Wily, who is revealed to now having become a Reploid himself, and his hooded Robot Masters join the battle. The Robot Masters are defeated almost instantly, making for a pretty weak climax to something they were setting up for 13 issues. Even Dr. Wally says that he did not expect them to be defeated so fast. Which, once again, makes me wonder why they seem to be the ones in charge in the first place. But it turns out that Dr. Wily has been hiding 150 Robot Masters from the various video games that apparently no one detected or knew about. And it's also revealed that his goal all along was to capture Roll for being the first Reploid with a soul. Oh, and there's also a human resistance that is brought up in the last two or three issues, but they're kinda pointless. Anyway, the good guys lose due to the sheer number difference. And as everyone is seemingly unconscious, Mega Man goes on a fit of rage and shoots a powerful blast at Dr. Wily, who is then saved at the last moment by aliens that came out of nowhere. And as all of this was happening, the Mega Corporation bosses perform a ritualistic sacrifice of a young girl for unknown reasons. And then the comic ends! Yes, that's it! The comic ends! There are no more issues after this! Who are the aliens? What are they? Why are there aliens? What is this Mega Corporation? Why are they sacrificing people? And what does any of this have to do with Mega Man? I. <laughs> if you thought the plot was getting weird and confusing, trust me, you weren't the only one. This series has so many long setups with disappointing endings, or plot threads that are dropped or forgotten almost as quickly as they're set up. And there are so many inconsistencies and story points that are just not properly explained. They keep saying that Roll has a soul and can think for herself, but we see nothing that separates her from the rest of the cast in that regard. They all seem to think for themselves and have the same range of emotions as anyone else. She's only special because the plot says so. This comic, man, it really makes no goddamn sense. I'm not even sure who this is for. Between the constantly shifting art style, hard to follow storyline, and lack of adherence to the Mega Man lore, it seems like they just kept making stuff up as they went along. I mean, I guess on one hand, this series is worth a read merely due to how much of a mess it is. But it's not like it didn't have potential. On some issues the art was actually pretty good for the time. But for the most part, there are just so many problems here that I don't even know where to begin. I mean, at one point, between Rawl, Mega Man, X, Kalinka, her bodyguard, Proto Man, Bass and Zero, there are so many characters on the main team that they barely get any time to breathe or have any sort of character development. Especially when you consider that each issue had an average of 30 pages. And that's counting the cover, editorial pages, fan mail and posters. Often, half of each issue was dedicated to fighting, with very little room left for plot progression, character arcs or moments where the characters are allowed to be themselves. As previously mentioned, I feel the story around the comics, as well as the fan mail and editor pages, are more interesting than the comics themselves. But, if you want to check them out, you can find English translations online for free. Though the editor pages and fan mail are left in their original languages. But if you're going to check them out, I recommend making sure you update your firewall first. So, yes, the novels of Intudish the Mega Man aren't really worth a read, but for better or worse, they are part of this character's history. And while it's not canon, it may or may not be official. And if nothing else, it's a fascinating window to a different take on Capcom's Blue Bomber. So I guess, at least, that's worth something. Hey everyone, thank you for watching Stika's Retro Corner. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, Hit that notification bell and share this video, all that fun social media stuff. And you can also support me on Patreon. It may not seem like it, but even $1 is a really big help in keeping this channel going. I would also like to thank my newest Patreon supporter, Ivo Moraes. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Bye!